This is a relationship that breaks every rule in the book. Some of the most dangerous predators on our planet, accepting a human into their midst. Ever get the feeling you've been surrounded by lions? <laughs> I get it every day. It has taken Kevin Richardson years of patience and dedication to build these unique bonds. But keeping predators in captivity is fraught with difficulty. A lion is in need of an urgent operation. A hyena cub learns to stand on all four feet the hard way. My oh, poor little boy. There's devastating news in one of the lion prides. There's no evidence to suggest a fighter. And Kevin faces a race against time to save the animals and where they live. I would hate nothing more than to see this place go and the animals in it. It's uh, my life and soul. This is the kingdom of the White Lion, a 700-hectare private wildlife sanctuary run by Kevin Richardson. It's home to some of Africa's most dangerous and rarest predators, lions, hyenas, and two black leopards. Eight prides live here, and in the Big Kings, the largest pride of all, there's a lion that needs an urgent operation. Hello, Rafik. Come lie down here, my boy. Come lie down Five-year-old Rafiki has spent his life with an ungainly saunter, and it's getting worse. He has an extra dew claw on both of his hind legs that shouldn't be there. They are a deformity and need to be amputated. Vet Jonathan Fish has been called out to remove them. I think you've seen it before. The dew claws. Yeah, but his ones are not as integral. They're not as attached. They, they're kind of like just hanging on by a thread of skin. Yeah. And when he walks around, it just flops around, you know. Dew claws are normally only found on the front legs of a lion, not the back. They act like thumbs and are used to hunt and hold down prey while lions eat. But Kevin is worried Rafiki's redundant dew claws could be accidentally torn off with the risk of serious infection. And by removing them, he hopes it will help the ungainly lion to walk properly. Before the operation, Rafiki needs to be anesthetized. So I think what I'll do is I'll just uh, entice him with some pieces of meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rafik, Rafiki, Rafiki. They use a pole syringe to inject him with the sedative. Yeah. Willie, I'm going to just time it. Leave you alone. Okay, okay. Leave him alone. Let's go, let's go. Anesthetizing a lion is risky. The dose is difficult to judge. Too much, and his heart could stop. Too little, and he could wake up early. Yeah. Quite a hard dose. Yeah, he's going down like a ton of bricks. He's okay? Yeah. One, two, three, cut. Once he's safely sedated, Jonathan needs to work quickly. Right, so I'm going to cut through the skin first. Right. There's some major blood vessels under there? No, there's a big blood vessel that supplies the skin. Yeah. And... There's a big one that supplies the claw itself. I mean, if you can imagine having that attached to your leg yeah. and walking around with that, it must be highly irritating. No special technique there, you just... Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Sure, look at that, huh? Mm. 
They check to make sure Rafiki's not showing any signs of the anesthetic wearing off. If he wakes up early, he could attack them. They remove the second claw and stitch the wound. Um, the problem with the lions are they all, their tongues are very, very rough and they pull stitches out quite easily. To avoid this, Jonathan uses internal stitches that he hopes will keep the wound closed while it heals. What a difference, eh? Look at that. There you go. Look like a normal lion, my boy. You're going to be so thankful. With the operation over, Rafiki is left to recover. Just get him comfortable. Yeah. They now need to make sure the wounds don't reopen and become infected. A few hours after the operation, and with Rafiki just about on all four feet again, he's released back into the big king's pride. Probably got a huge headache. So Rafiki's just come out, and he's actually just trying to find some peace and quiet. <laughs> he's gone to a spot in the shade, and the youngsters keep pestering him. All the adults couldn't really be bothered. They've understood what's going on, I think. They've said, OK, leave him alone. He looks a bit grumpy, but not the youngsters. They are curious about these bandages and the smell of these bandages, and they keep on harassing him. And he, he's getting up and, and giving them a good beating and then going back down. Kevin originally helped to set up the kingdom in 2005 for the production of a fictional movie following the story of a white lion. The retired stars of the film now live out their days here, alongside some of Kevin's favorite lions from his former job at another lion park. The feeding of the animals, vets' bills, and general maintenance cost up to $20,000 a month, all paid for by a private investor. But now the funding is running low, and Kevin needs to find a way for the park to become self-sufficient. If he can't, all the animals could be sold. I've made a promise to them, I made a commitment to them. So at the first hurdle, I'm not gonna waver and just throw in the towel, it's far too easy. For Kevin, finding a way for the kingdom to contribute to the conservation of lions is crucial. One day he hopes to open it to the public and give educational tours. It's the day after Big King Rafiki's operation, and Kevin heads over to check up on him. The cubs have tried their best to pull off Rafiki's bandages, but with no luck. There we go. There we go. Now, you can have some now they do need to be removed. Kevin has two choices. Put the lion through another risky anesthetic. Let's all flop on each other. Or chance taking the bandages off himself. Kevin's insight into the pride dynamics is crucial in judging the right time. Pick the wrong moment and he will be at the mercy of over 210 kilograms of angry lion. He's in a much better mood. He's recovered quite well. And he's a lot less grumpy than he was yesterday. Eh? And I think, well, he's in a great mood. I'm going to try and take his bandages off. If I can cut through the whole length of it, he'll be able to pull it off himself. One of the really cool things about having a relationship with a lion is that if there's anything that you need to look at or inspect, it's quite easy to do it without having to put them under. I can look at a little wound, I can say, okay, well that doesn't really need any treatment. I can try and get the bandages off his paw, don't have to re-knock uh, him out again. 
Hey, Flicking, it's, I'm really irritated with you. Okay, got it. With Rafiki on the road to recovery, no one is prepared for the shocking events about to unfold in another lion pride. The next morning brings heartbreaking news. Lion cub Vietzi is alone and distressed in his enclosure. There's been a tragic discovery. The dead body of Vietzi's best friend, Mufumu. Vietzi, who grew up with Mufumu, is now desperately craving attention. For the last five weeks, the two cubs had lived in a pride with three older lions, Tristan, Zippo, and Nash, following their successful introduction. Um, yeah, when I got here, all the lions were around Mufumu's body. And uh, what was quite disturbing is when I got there is that um, his um, the stomach area had been opened up, so it looked like they had been feeding on him. Yesterday he seemed fine. Um, just before I went, I went home, so he wasn't. He definitely wasn't sick. Baez is a little bit scared, but um, I've just phoned Kevin as well to let him know what has happened, and uh, he's uh, on his way here. The discovery is a shock. Rodney fears the three older lions may have attacked and killed Cub Mufumu. For Vietzi's safety, they've been separated and put in another enclosure. As soon as Kevin arrives, it's vital they determine how Mufumu died and whether the older lions were responsible. After hearing the terrible news of Cub Mufumu's death, Kevin has rushed to the kingdom. He wants to know if there are any clues that may reveal if the cub was killed by the older lions, Tristan, Zippo, and Nash. Although Mufumu and Vietzi had lived apparently happily with the pride for over a month, introducing new lions always carries a risk. Even if it's done as carefully as possible, violent attacks can still happen. There's no evidence to suggest a fighter. If he was in a fight, the only way they're going to kill this guy is in the neck, immediately, a, a mm. suffocating bite. Mm. Mm. While the others rip him apart. Mm. If you look here, there's absolutely no puncture wounds. No, there's nothing. Nothing in the neck on his back legs where they normally bite them. Nothing. When lions attack, they claw and bite their prey from behind, pulling it to the ground. A suffocating bite then closes the victim's airways. On the neck, on the face, look at his face. Mm. His face is perfect. There's not even a mark on his face. And the other thing that's not adding up is that, you know, when, you, when I got the call, I, I immediately had, uh, thought of Ayetzi. Immediately mm. thought this is Vietzi's being killed. Mm. If it was to, an altercation with them, because this guy was more confident, he was more sociable. Vietzi was a little bit more skittish and, and, and a little bit more terrified, you know. And they mm. obviously hone in on that kind of, wow. you know. You know what I'm thinking? Mm. Tongue does look a bit swollen. I'm thinking Pafeta. Tongue swells up, he can't breathe. Mm. The puff adder is a highly venomous snake. One bite on the throat could be enough to asphyxiate a young lion. And that's what Kevin believes happened to Mufumu. Don't even know what to say. I think what we need to do is maybe today just bury the body. No. It's likely that once Mufumu died, 
the older lions began to investigate the carcass and tear it open. The truth be known is that it does happen. Uh, it happens in the wild and it does happen in captivity too. But if an animal does die, sometimes, you know, they, they do tuck into it and they do start to consume it. And sometimes once their carcass opens up, a kind of like feeding instinct and frenzy takes over. Later that day, Mufumu is laid to rest in one of the kingdom's most peaceful areas. Okay, it's lovely. Kevin is now faced with a dilemma what to do about the remaining cub, Vietzi. As a precaution, for now, he'll have to live on his own. We can kind of give him the attention that he kind of requires at, at, at the age that he is now, but ultimately, he's gonna grow up alone. So we need to seriously think about what to do next. And I don't have the answers at the moment. I'm just trying to get over What's, what's gone on and what, what, how to deal with the circumstances. After seeing his fellow pride mates feeding on Mufumu's body, Vietzi is now timid and scared. Come here, my boy. Kevin doesn't want to risk putting the grieving cub back with the older lions in case he's picked on. You know, I've worked with lions so long and this lion's clearly missing his brother and It'll take some time, like it does in people, for him to get over it. But he will, he will get over it, he'll move on. Uh, it just means that we're going to spend a lot more time with him and give him a lot more attention, especially during the next couple of weeks, you know, just while he's pining. You can hear him, it's a melancholy uh, cry, and he's trying to call, he, he doesn't understand, you know, what's, what's kind of going on. Shame, you're feeling lonely. Eh? What happened here? But in the long run, Kevin knows human company alone just isn't going to be enough. Let's go for a walk. Tristan, Zippo, and Nash, removed after Mafumu's death, are now being taken to meet the three other members of their former pride. They're going to be reintroduced to Bobcat, Bandit, and Gabby, the other half of the so-called terrible teens. For the last five weeks, the two groups have been living apart. But they quickly recognize each other. When Mufumu died, obviously that's uh, created a bit of a problem. And what we've decided to do is let this group rejoin, reunite. So the six um, have got back together. That was very peaceful. Maybe that's because you all know each other now, eh? That's a good group of lions, man. That's what I'm This is the last yeah. empty enclosure. But now the terrible teen's pride is moving in full time. We certainly have a space predicament now at the kingdom because we don't have one free area um, to put lions in. This is a bit of a problem because every time I want to rotate animals around, it means we've got to take a group of animals and, and, and put them somewhere else in like a makeshift area. So it's not the ideal situation. With the reformation of the pride, the kingdom has reached capacity and there's no money to build new enclosures. Finding ways to fund the kingdom has forced Kevin to look outside the park and outside his comfort zone. So today I'm doing a motivational talk just talking about the lions and talking about what I do. I must say, I'm feeling very, very nervous, but I think it's, hopefully it's gonna go well. I um, don't know what to expect because I've never done one of these before. Getting off the point, this chap is fascinating and we reckon that if we all put our resources together, we might yet save this planet. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Kevin Richardson. Despite the alien environment, this is an avenue Kevin can ill afford to ignore. We, I start with them when they're really young. The will to learn is really what it's about. 
Businesses are willing to pay a premium to see him talk about his life with lions. None of the animals that I interact with are truly wild, as in the you know, definition of going to the Kruger Park or into Botswana. You know, this picture did the rounds all over the world, people saying, this is this crazy ranger from South Africa, and he found, came across this pride of lions, and he you know, made a really special bond. He just whispered to them. <laughs> so when I read this, I was quite, I was quite amused. <laughs> I thought, okay, well, and I was a bit worried. I thought, oh, geez, what's going on there? People are thinking these things which aren't true, really, about me. With this first public talk under his belt, Kevin is hoping that there will be more lucrative bookings in the pipeline. Back at the kingdom, Cub Vietzi is still grieving for his best friend, Mufumu. <laughs> With the lion's welfare at stake, Kevin decides there's only one solution. He's hoping that his former employers at a nearby lion park may have a cub of a similar age that he could pair with Vietzi. One of our lions is in desperate need of a, a partner. A partner. Yeah, and sure he's, he's a bit lonely. Yeah. I'm 99.9% sure we can help you out. Cool. Is it, I mean, but obviously... Welcome to it. If it's yeah. So that's really good news. Um, the Lion Park does have some uh, females of the age that we require. So it looks like Vayetzi is going to get a partner. And this is excellent news because he's pine been pining over the last couple of days. He's really, every time you walk past the enclosure, he's calling and calling. The next day, Kevin heads off to the park near Johannesburg. Yeah, good. Good, good, good. Whoop. They're going to meet several hand-raised lion cubs under a year old. <laughs> Kevin and Rodney feel confident that the cubs are still young enough to start building a relationship with them, and crucially, with Vietzi. Hello, my sweetheart. Hey, are you coming to a new home? Are you coming to meet Vietzi? They're looking for a female, likely to be more submissive around the traumatized male cub. You're quite a fasty bunch. Yeah, we're going to have to instill some discipline. There is one perfect year-old lioness. But she has a sister, and the park doesn't want them separated. It's an extra mouth to feed, but the two show they might just have what it takes to win over Vietzi. I think this is absolute perfect age for Vietzi, because they're slightly smaller than him, slightly younger. There's two of them. He needs a bit of confidence boosting, so he's going to feel a lot more relaxed interacting with smaller lions than he. Having spent their entire young lives at the lion park, the lionesses are not accustomed to being loaded into a van. Come on! Oh! Finally, with the help of a few tasty treats, they're on their way to the kingdom. But the big test is yet to come. Will Vietzi accept them? After the traumatic death of his best friend Mufumu, Vietzi is about to meet two unfamiliar lionesses. The newcomers, Livy and Ginny, are nervous. Come on. It's their first time being introduced to a strange lion, and they're wary of Vietzi. <laughs> and without his best friend Mufumu to back him up, Vietzi is also reluctant to make the first move. Slowly, not me. Kevin decides to step in as mediator. The funny thing is that Vietti is really and truly using me as a human shield. Every time he comes to interact with these girls, funny enough, I'm in the middle, hey? What I'm going to do is I think the lions must get to know each other and he must gain some confidence on his own. I'm going to just uh, slowly separate myself out of here. 
and let them uh, mingle. And it's up to him to impress the ladies now. Yo! Because it's time for you to be a man, my son. Kevin patiently waits until everyone relaxes. This is the kingdom kind of lines, eh? All love. This is all about love, my boy. The kingdom full of love. Here we go. But replacing the bond that Vietzi had with Mufumu is not going to happen immediately. <coughs> the next few days are key. Over in the nursery, the young hyenas are also about to meet a new friend. Abandoned animals born at the kingdom are brought here to be socialized. Four-week-old cub Max was hand-raised after a deadly power struggle between the females in his clan ended in his siblings being killed. Hello, my boy. <laughs> Max has been bottle-fed for the last month, and now Kevin and Rodney are introducing him to the other youngsters. Look here. It's important he learns to mix with other hyenas while he's still young. What's that? If he doesn't, he risks never being able to live in a clan. Listen, you guys, you better behave. Behave yourselves. Today is the very first time that he'll be let free with the other excited cubs. Grab here, give you a hot advantage. It's a tense moment. Let's take that out the way. Even young hyenas can be highly aggressive when sorting out their hierarchy. Oh. Okay, slowly, 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 slowly. It's just excitement. And they're all just trying to tell him, hey, this is, this is me, I'm, I'm uh, Woody. I'm the boss here, <laughs> and then they're all taking turns and saying, I'm Benza, and I'm the, re and they're trying to get in his box. Max is a, a male, and in this group we have predominantly females. Um, so there might be a little bit of neck biting and ooh, we the dominant females, but I think it's gonna go very well. I think Max will be quite fine. It's all very new for you, boy. This is part of the socialization process, and we'll be doing this on an almost daily basis with Max. Every day, just give him a little bit more time with the hyenas. He can, uh, he can spend uh, the days here, and then ultimately uh, the night. There we go. The future for Max and other animals depends on Kevin financing the kingdom. To generate income, he plans to open it to the public. But first, he needs to find the investment to build suitable facilities. To help raise money, he recently set up a local volunteer program where people pay to help out at the park. For me, it's, um, it's a way of getting involved and, and, and trying to make a difference. In, in, I think we live in a beautiful country and I think um, this is just my way of, of getting involved. I think everybody has to pick what you're passionate about and this um, is mine. So, um, yeah, I lo I'm looking forward to working here for a long time. Kevin's wife, Mandy, is visiting the kingdom along with their son, Tyler. With the local volunteer program proving a success, there are now plans to expand it internationally. Taking paying guests from overseas could provide a significant income. But first, they need to work out a program worth paying for. Hello, Daddy. Hello, Hello. Did you enjoy your drive? I've just been thinking now in terms of the work, I was thinking like um, anti-poaching, so going out and looking for traps and things, um, river cleanups on the riverside, um, bush cutting, fire breaks, fence maintenance or in terms of checking, fixing, and then possibly that idea we were thinking about the camera traps and yeah. setting up the camera traps just to see what actual wildlife is naturally occurring here, but just to get some records and, and see what actually is going on out there. Um, you know, I've been discussing with, with Rodney about putting collars on uh, some of the jackal that occur naturally, the leopard, the brown hyena, and seeing their movements and seeing their whereabouts. Mm. and. So together with the camera traps, um, fantastic. I mean, we've got a natural 
uh, diversity and wildlife in this area that also needs conserving. It's two weeks since Kevin introduced White Lion Thor to lionesses Kusasa and Sabindi. He decided that Thor, having spent his life as a bachelor, needed some company of his own kind. Lions are the only truly sociable cat. But it seems Thor is the exception. Although the three have settled down peacefully enough, they continue to keep their distance. As one of the leading stars of the White Lion movie, Thor stole the limelight. Now the bachelor is seemingly too shy to make the first move on his new lady friends. What's going on with you and those girls, eh? Don't you like those girls? Why can't you just be with them like us? Eh? Be nice to them. Kusasa and Sabindi have been with Thor for around about two, two and a half weeks now. And it really hasn't gone as I expected. I expected a little bit of friction in the beginning. And then um, two and a half weeks later, I expected this happy pride lying under a tree. It's, it's kind of weird because the females have settled nicely in the enclosure. And there's almost this easy indifference. They're quite happy to live side by side but they don't come close to each other. I'm glad I've tried it because, you know, if we didn't try it, we would never know. And we would always be wondering. So each to their own, you know, animals are all different. And when you think what's good for one is not necessarily good for another. After spending years building a close bond with White Lion Thor, Kevin is going to test their relationship following the introduction of the two new lionesses. He's been waiting to pick the right time and with all peaceful in the newly formed pride, he comes to a decision. A lot of people must be thinking, well, how do you know for sure that when you go in there, he's not gonna just you know, jump on you and take you out? Um, and it's kind of like when you know somebody over a period of time, you will understand um, when they're in a bad mood or a good mood, not by speaking to them, but just by looking at them. And those are the, the messages that uh, Thor will send me. Um, I've, I haven't noticed any of that of late, so I'm going to take it one step at a time and see how it goes. <laughs> His instinct proves right. Mm -hmm. With everyone relaxed, Thor shows he still has a place in his new pride for Kevin. And in another pride, there's one more success story. Following the traumatic loss of his best friend Mafumu, Vietzi has spent the last few weeks getting to know lionesses Ginny and Livy. I don't mind nice spots. Much to Kevin's relief, Vietzi is no longer pining for his old friend. <laughs> I've been attacked. I've been mauled. Having seen how his, his happiness has changed over the last couple of weeks, he's completely a relaxed, happy lion again. And they, they get along very, very well. They all lie together. They're always licking each other. Livy, which is the paler one, is a little bit more shy, a little bit more reserved, um, and does take a lot of her cues from her sister, who's a little bit more... Uh, she's darker, uh, old Ginny, and uh, a little bit more adventurous. She was actually the first one to uh, bond with Fayetzi. Stop that now! Oh! Once again, it's Kevin's turn to establish his place in another new pride. Forging new relationships now is key to being able to interact with these lions when they're older. No. Even though these two girls have been hand-raised, they're not used to people sitting and lying down with them. So when they see me on the ground, they see it as an opportunity to jump on my back or stalk me or go around or bite my top, which is not a behavior or a trait that I want to, you know, reward or enforce. Why is it whenever I wear a fluffy top, you want to eat me? 
the three lions put Kevin through his paces. Stop it! It's vital for Kevin to weed out behaviors like this now. What may be playful to another lion is far more dangerous to a human. Stop it! What they don't realize is that I'm just a human and I've got very thin skin. I'm not like Vietzi where they can actually bite him physically quite hard. So every time they bite me, I'm trying to show them that I don't like that. Don't bite me hard. Ay, ay, ay. Don't bite hard. No. So things like lying down, uh, teaching them not to unsheath their claws, all that kind of stuff has got to be installed now. How do I do it? Just come in here, spend time with them. When they exhibit a trait that I don't like, I discipline them. Generally, when it's in play, and we're just sitting around and I'm tickling her and then she tries to bite me hard, just give her a gentle no. Hey, no. Her ears go back, she gets the message. And it's the most amazing, they learn very quickly. Those girls are naughty. And in fact, they're a lot more abusive than I am. Um, I've seen lions this age in a pride get a hell of a smack from, from the old man because they're really getting on his nerves. Don't chew me. Don't sneak up behind me. Now she's realizing that it's not about biting Kevin's hand off. Uh, she could have a good gnaw on it. If she bites me too hard, she'll get a little bit of a, a warning on her nose. But there we go. That's the behavior I like. And it seems Vietzi is not immune to Ginny and Livy's influence. The girl's oh feisty behavior is rubbing off. Stop that now. I'm going to work a little bit harder at trying to build relationships with these two and also trying to stop their naughty behaviors from creeping in because this guy's got very naughty in the last couple of weeks. Yes, you know you have. You have. You're a naughty lion. From the other side of the kingdom, there's alarming news. A bushfire has broken out and is being fanned by high winds. Without road access, it would take hours for the fire service to reach them. It's up to Kevin and his staff to try and contain it. There's two things. I mean, it could burn the whole farm down. Then the animals have got nothing to eat. And also, it can trap animals unnecessarily. Thank goodness it's far away from the lion store. But I've seen the wind turn, eh? When the wind starts to pump, there's nothing stopping this fire. So we, we need to get this fire out now. Come on. Bushfires are a fact of life in South Africa. But they can have devastating consequences, destroying vast swathes of land and anything in their path. A few hours later, the worst is over. It looks like we got it under control. It looks like we put it out. Only problem is, is I've seen this situation many times before. And when we all just go back and relax and talk about the incident, it flares back up again because the wind picks up. The wind's died down a bit. So um, at the moment, we're looking good. But what we'll do is we'll just keep some boys around here with the beaters, just in case we have a little flare up, put it under control again. With one crisis narrowly averted, Kevin heads back to the other side of the kingdom. Come, Maxie! Come, 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 quickly! Quickly! Max, the hyena cub's big day, has finally arrived. After surviving against all odds, he's now ready to join the nursery full time. But Max's enthusiasm to join the new clan is exciting the others. <coughs> Before Kevin has a chance to take him into the enclosure, Max suddenly makes a run for it, disappearing behind the nursery's fence. <laughs> Come on, 
Did he bite him? Badly. Oh, <laughs> Rod. Off. No, no, it's not. Oh, okay, come, bring, bring him there. Max's inquisitiveness ends in bloodshed. First aid kit. In his excitement to join the others in the nursery, newcomer hyena cub Max pushed his ear through the fence. One of the older dominant cubs retaliated and bit him hard. Maxie went around the back of the fence and so he got a little bit of a, a nick out of his ear and it's bleeding a bit, but you'll live my boy. You're, it's a big day for you. Shame, man, look at that, you brave little fella. Looked worse than it was, eh? Mm. So it's not atypical for a hyena adult to react to a young hyena like Max. Max was excited, you know, running around the pens and everyone's, you know, excitement was just a little bit too high. Um, and he managed to, you know, grab him through the fence. We're going to put you in with those terror. Now there you go again, you see? There you go again. A little bit more cautiously this time. <laughs> Uh, they, you know, hyenas are so tough. A little wound like that, that would probably send a human being baby to hospital for a couple of days. With Max recovered, Kevin takes him into the nursery. In no time at all, the cub forgets about his sore ear and starts to befriend the new clan. But the biggest test is still in store. At the end of every day, all the nursery residents are safely shut away in a night shelter. If Max manages to spend the night unscathed, he will be on his way to establishing his status in the clan. The following morning, it's a big moment as they wait to find out. This morning we came and you're always a little bit apprehensive, but uh, when Rod let them out, they all sprung out of the nursery. Uh, no bite marks, all just one uh, cohesive unit. So I think it's, it's really well done on all fronts, you know. From the, from the fact that Max actually survived, um, he was just so tiny. And we were so lucky to actually intervene when we did. Because I guarantee you, if we didn't, he would be dead. And there's more good news. The first bookings for the International Volunteer Program are in. It means there is another way to help secure the future of the park. Kevin can now turn his attention to his long-term goal, finding a way to open the kingdom to the public. A facility like the kingdom is really important in educating people about the plight of the lion in the wild. And you know, from my perspective, let's face it, if I'd never saw a lion in the zoo when I was a child, I probably would never have had a connection later on. Um, so that's hopefully what a facility like the Kingdom can do. It can make one little guy change his life, and he wants to grow up and be a conservation officer. Then we've done our, we've done our job. At home, Mandy also hopes their hard work is finally paying off. I think it would be a long time dream for us to finally have the kingdom open and running and, and yes, hopefully when Tyler gets big, maybe take it on and carry on with it as a family business. Um, certainly it's something we've been passionate about for long enough and it's not something we're going to give up on in a hurry. So I do hope it will be going in the long time. Where are you going? <laughs> So the, the last six to eight months at the Kingdom have been really hard. It's been tough times, but things have turned around, things have looked up. Um, we've really applied our minds to how we can make the place a success, and it's slowly turning. In the future, I think uh, we're all feeling a lot more optimistic 
However, it's still, it's still tough times. So yeah, we've just got to continue forward.